I'm going to be looking at Ethiopia um, and looking at it historically, if uh, 10 years is a historical time frame, uh, because I think we have some very interesting lessons learned that we are building on during the current crisis there. And I'm speaking from the lessons that USAID has learned, uh, both um, in terms of the challenges, but also in terms of working with other donors as well as the national governments in building capacity and building resilience, if you will. Um, for AID, the challenge has always been how we respond. We have a very immediate response to a humanitarian crisis, followed by what a short-term response of up to two years, which we've called mitigation assistance, followed by development assistance. And looking at our record, what we find is that we respond to a crisis. I mean, we don't question it, we just respond. And we put as much money and other resources that we have to that response. In 2003, in the um, food crisis, the Horn, Ethiopia's crisis in 2003, we put $500 million in to immediate assistance. That same year, we had $5 million working on a long-term response, if you will, building resilience. After this crisis, our administrator at the time sent a senior level technical team out and said, okay, this has got to stop. We have got to link our relief to development. Our, my feeling is we need to link our development to relief because we were always very poor at working in those areas that tended to be the hardest hit. The recommendations coming out of the study were just that. We needed to, to provide a long-term response to reduce the vulnerability of households and communities to shocks. At the same time, the Ethiopian government had also announced a new coalition. It began taking ownership of humanitarian assistance. The productive safety net program, which David mentioned earlier, was put in place at that time. And what that did was align donor investments with government priorities. And a lesson was that it actually did have an impact. And what we've seen in this current crisis is in those areas, in those with those households, in those communities that were part of the productive safety net program, Resilience was built. How is it defined? Their ability to be able to provide food for their households was longer than in previous crises. They weren't totally resilient, but the length of time that they needed food assistance was shortened. Another thing is that the interventions need to be scalable. It requires more than just building household and community resilience to shock. And this is where the other side of the equation comes in, that is the economic growth side. You need to be building economic resilience too, particularly in geographic spaces such as the Horn, where you're dealing with arid and semi-arid lands. The resource base is degraded. You have to build that back up. It, you can't continue to degrade it. Also, that there's a regional dimension that was missing from the work in 2003. The humanitarian response is, is transborder, got conflict, climate change, disaster risk management, migration. All are regional issues, not just national issues. And finally, it's very interesting, the discussions that are going on now, there is a good case for building the capacity to respond, and that is in the Sahel, where 
There's a well-functioning monitoring system, and there's regional coordination mechanisms, both African as well as donor. Okay, so where we are today. Ending drought emergencies in the Horn of Africa is our latest um, initiative, if you will, African initiative. Some of the lessons are being addressed. We're undertaking a coordinated regional response. Africa itself, the Africa Union, has identified EGAD as the lead to respond. A regional investment plan is being developed, similar to what Ethiopia did back in 2003, building on and complementing what national governments already have. The national governments, most of the member states in EGAD have uh, CADAP or CADAP-like investment plans. So they've identified their national priorities. It's then putting the regional lens on top of it. And the goal is drought-resistant livelihoods as well as drought-resistant communities and the larger arid and semi-arid lands. So, now it comes down to us as donors and our development partners. How are we going to go about aligning our investments in the Horn? And there are a number of processes that are already being put in place. There's a joint program planning design for long-term development of the arid and semi-arid lands at both national and regional levels. This has been African-led. There was a meeting in early September hosted by ILRI uh, and AU IBAR taking the lead that identified the critical areas, building on lessons learned and analyses that have been done today. What are the six to seven critical areas that investments need to be made and we need to be aligning our investments to? Also to build on existing mechanisms and knowledge. We don't need to start afresh. And I think this is a lesson. We, we tend to get pushed into new initiatives all the time. And yet the lessons are there and what we have been doing, we can build upon. But it's taking the time to reflect just a bit and that's been done too. And then finally, there's been the establishment of a technical consortium to promote collective and harmonized approaches to the different country and regional investment plans, as well as facilitate dialogue between various st stakeholders. And this is an ongoing effort. So, uh, that technical consortium is being housed at ILRI, which is gonna be the secretariat. And it is a consortium not just of donors, uh, NGOs, but also research organizations, the CGAR and others. So, thank you. Thank you very much.